Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, on behalf of the Jefferson Educational Society, I'd like to welcome you to the Erie Center for Arts and Technology. They are our partner in the satellite programming here um, on the east side of Erie. Uh, my name is Raven Clark. I'm the satellite program coordinator at the Jefferson. Uh, we partnered with ECAT to host one to two programs each month here. So I'm gonna let you know of the upcoming programs, of course. Um, Thursday, July 13th, we will have visiting speaker Lenore Skomel, and she will give a presentation about her experiences as a Broadway writer. Thursday, July 27th, we will have JES scholar in residence, Dr. Paris Baker, and he will give a lecture about Afrocentrism. Thursday, August 3rd, Dr. Ken Louie will give a lecture about poverty in Erie and the data behind the crisis. And Thursday, August 24th, we will have a panel discussion about black masculinity that will feature previous JES speakers, Dr. Rhonda Matthews, Dr. Adrian Dixon, Antonio Howard, and Dr. Paris Baker. We also have four other satellite locations. Um, here are some upcoming programs for next month, um, well, later this month and next month. Wednesday, June 28th, we will have our first program at Harbor Creek. Harbor Creek's our newest satellite location at the Harbor Creek Township building. And that will include, that'll be Wednesday, June 28th, and that'll include the Harbor, Ship, Harbor Creek Township Board of Supervisors, and they will talk about their vision for the future of Harbor Creek Township. Wednesday, July 5th, we will have Melinda Meyer, and she will give a presentation about the Harbor Creek Historical Society. Monday, June 17th, John Seitz will be returning to give his presentation, a Guide to Local Archaeology, which is a pretty interactive presentation. It's cool. Um, that'll be in Fairview. Tuesday, July 18th, JES scholar in residence, Dr. Judy Lynch, will give a presentation about Marquise de Lafayette and his trip to Northwest PA 200 years ago. And Monday, July 24th, JES scholar in residence, Dr. David Frew will give a lecture about the Lake Erie Yellow Perch and whether they are going extinct. So I encourage you all to take a look at our website. You will see all the upcoming programs. We have programs at our main location on State Street. We also have online programs uh, here at ECAT, um, Edinburgh, Fairview, Cory, and now in Harbor Creek. So like I said, take a look at our website. You can see all of the upcoming stuff. We also have recordings from previous lectures on there as well, so you can take a look at that. And I encourage you to follow us on social media. So tonight we will learn about how a labor union is working to increase minority, particip minority participation in the trades from distinguished visiting speaker DeWitt Walton. Born in Mississippi and reared in Gary, Indiana by activist parents, DeWitt Walton is a 25 plus year employee of the United Steelworkers Union and is currently assigned to the Civil, Rights, Civil and Human Rights Department. He has served as an organizer, strategic campaigner, and assistant to the union's international president. He is also currently the vice president of the Pittsburgh chapter of the A. Philip Randolph Institute and is an alumnus of Idaho, Idaho State University. He also served in VISTA, which is Volunteers in Service to America, the domestic equivalent to the Priest Corps. Walton is the District 10 labor representative for Allegheny County and he lives in the Hill District in Pittsburgh. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DeWitt Walton. Um, <clears throat> I, I really need to do an update on that bio. <laughs> uh -oh. um, give us the update. Yeah, um, I retired two years ago as an assistant to the international president of the Steelworkers, and I, uh, continue to serve as vice president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, Pittsburgh chapter. And I was just reelected uh, last month uh, to, my, um, to be the Democratic nominee for Allegheny County Council. And if I'm successful in November, I will serve my third, I will, I will serve my third term as Allegheny County Councilman. Um, it has been an incredible experience for me to do, to be blessed to be able to do the things that I've done and have the experiences that I've had. Um, as a high school senior, I was fortunate enough to be able to work my first political campaign. Um, much of that stuff, when we talked earlier about um, from women, mm -hmm. um, I learned my sense of activism from my mama. Yeah, can you talk about um, that? Your parents were activists. Yeah, um, 
my mom used to drag me around the neighborhood uh, collecting for the March of Dads and all of this stuff and, and, and knocking on doors and meeting folk and talking to folk. She was just nebby. You know, that's a Pittsburgh term, nebby. Uh, uh, you know, she just nosy and just, you know, but again, um, she was also a shop steward in the clothing factory that she worked in, the amalgamated, and they were represented by the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union, Act Two. My dad uh, worked at uh, U.S. Steel Gary Works, and my dad was a shop steward um, to um, this guy named Jack Pardon for 24 years. Jack ultimately became the, um, the president of, of, of Local 1010 of the Steelworkers. And, when, and then he moved on to become the district director, um, the, um, the regional director for the Steelworkers for District 31. And Jack ultimately hired me to, um, to become uh, a Steelworker staffer. Uh, I was the first one in my, parent, in my family to graduate from college. And when I came home uh, on February 22nd, 1990, and told my parents that I had just gotten appointed to the staff of the Steelworkers Union, my dad was happier that day than he was when I walked across the stage, the first person in my, in my family to graduate from college. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the steel work, all of those stuff, all of that stuff has been really interwoven. Um, as I shared, um, I worked as a, as a high school senior for the election of Richard Gordon Hatcher. Um, R um, Mayor Hatcher got elected in November in 1967. He and Carl Stokes from Cleveland were the first mayors of major cities, first class cities. Oh, what's up, man? You. See, you, see, all y'all brought the troublemakers out of the house. <laughs> so, you know, uh, they were elected the uh, mayors of the first major cities in the United States, African Americans. Mm -hmm. And so um, all of that stuff has really been really a real transformative in my life and it has really shaped how I've behaved and how I see the world and how I engage. You know, um, God, and I've been a real beneficiary of that kind of leadership, that kind of uh, attentiveness, and, 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 and that growth of, of, of mentors my entire life, um, from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, you know, uh, Oh, well, not fifth grade, because I hated my fifth grade teacher. But, uh, but sixth grade, Mr. Cowens, you know, uh, all of these people have really shaped who I am and, and, and what I've become and really made, made a difference and helped guide me down that path today to be a real advocate and having an opportunity to work with, with folks like, uh, 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 like Jim and the gentleman sitting behind him, you know, uh, uh, really trying to uh, build power and show folk, yeah, yes, we can. You know, it's amazing what we can do if we just look to build common ground and engage folk where they are and talk to folks candidly and responsibly and try to find common ground. And, um, and look, you know, uh, I got beat up on Tuesday night by a, by a ton of, by the, by the progressive community. Um, I, voted, I voted against a minimum wage ordinance um, Tuesday night um, at, Allegheny, at the Allegheny County Council meeting. And they tried to put it on the black, tried to, tried to uh, put this ordinance on the black, on the back of black women saying that black women were, uh, were uh, being underpaid and underrepresented. 80% of all African American women working for Allegheny County are union members. And so my response was, are you telling me 
that unions are negotiating substandard contracts? Are you, are you telling me, uh, sitting here, that, uh, um, yes, ma'am? Um, I'm just wondering, like, it was for the whole county or just the county employees? County employees. The ordinance was for the county? Just county employees, ma'am. Okay. And so are you telling me that, that, um, that unions are negotiating uh, substandard contracts? And I know um, because um, I sit there mm -hmm. and have conversations on a weekly basis with the county exec, the county manager, and be a and, and, and advocate uh, and advocate for negotiating good deals that are equitable. Um, very privately and very quietly, um, I uh, I was an advocate for the public defender's office, the the district attorney's office. That additional money was put in the budget to ensure that uh, good raises were there to make uh, because they were represent not only because they they deserved the money and they had been historically underpaid, but also because they were steel workers. Mm -hmm. do, we're going to do what's right. We're going to do what's principal. We're going to do what's honorable. I don't think people really know about that, though. Like how you said it's like quiet as it's kept, like behind closed doors kind of thing. Well, you know, the reality of it all, um, the reality of most things is uh, people's reaction is not grounded in reality. It's grounded in their emotional need and their, and their desire to respond. Mm, their reaction uh, to it. Yeah. So uh, even you have to, be, you know, if you're, I would prefer, I'm not aspirational. I'm not aspirational. I prefer to be inspirational. What's the difference? Uh, I don't aspire to, hire, to run for a higher office. Mm. Uh, I don't want to be uh, anything other than a county councilman. I'm, hey man, look, I'm having fun. I've had mm. fun, but again, I want to make a difference. I want, I want people to be empowered. I want people's lives to be more valuable. I want folks, I want to rebuild communities. I want to engage in transformational work. So how do you, so my, my next question is, how do you as an activist and a civic leader and a labor unionist, how do you engage with communities of color, um, especially when it comes to unions or maybe like voting or things like that where there are these institutions that people in communities of color might distrust them. How do you engage with them? Build relationships, create an environment, create an environment predicated on trust and integrity. Far too often, you know, people are being tired. I believe people are tired of hearing a line of BS. Mm -hmm. People have the ability, well, many folk, not everybody, but many folk have the ability to filter what's being said. And if you, say, if you engage them in a conversation that is, that is transparent, straightforward, folks will listen. They may not agree, and they may, they may challenge your logic, but if you put, for, if you put it forth in a, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that they can understand, they will listen. Mm -hmm. And then they, and, um, very frequently, they're gonna use sound reasonable reasoning to make, a, to make a decision. And all you want is folks to think about the decision that they make. Some folk you're not gonna reach no matter what. You're never gonna have unanimity but you want to be able to communicate in a way that the majority can make a, can make a, 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 a sound decision based upon the facts, the reality. We have a question. Yes, sir. You mentioned that you were inspirational and not aspirational. Mm -hmm. by being transparent, by being honest, by speaking truth to power, being accountable, being responsibility, engaging folk where they are, 
and living and acting in a way that gives folk uh, an opportunity to say, man, you know, yes, I can. By, by building an environment, for example, um, workforce development. We do workforce development. Um, I'm honest. I'm brutally honest. Uh, <laughs> am, I, am I lying? Um, uh, a young man, uh, one out of three of the folk that come through our workforce development program have criminal convictions. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a young man named Adolph. I called him Mikey. Uh, Mikey came to us. He had, just did, he had just done a nickel for sticking up gas stations. Um, Mikey came for an interview, and we, he passed our tape test. He had passed all this stuff, and he came for an interview. And I sit there, and I asked Mikey, man, what you do a nickel for? He said, man, I'm sticking up gas stations. Now, can I, can I use a little bit of profanity? I will uh, help. <laughs> look here. I told him, you dumb son of a bitch. If um, you out here sticking up gas stations, you got to be one of the stupidest people in the world. Because if you stick up a gas station, the most you're going to get is $200. And they the, have a video of it, you too. Know, I said, man, if you'd have stuck up my gas station, I'd have blew your damn head off. I'd have killed your ass. Don't you know that there's a better way? Mikey said, mm -hmm. Um, we gave Mikey a shot, um, and part of our operation, we put him on um, with PennDOT. We put him on a we put him on a uh, on a job, uh, an apprentice job with um, with a heavy highway contractor. Three months later, I was coming out of the building uh, a day that was raining. Mikey uh, was walking up the stairs. He said, man, I was coming to see you. And my first reaction, what has he done? Did he, um, did he get fired? What's happened? He told me, he said, man, look here. I was coming to thank you. This past Saturday, I took my son fishing. He said, for the first time in my life, for the first time in my son's life, I was able to take him out, spend a day with him, just us, doing something we'd never done before. He says, my life will never be the same. We have a million stories like that. That's what we do every day. Provide leadership, opportunity, and speak truth to power. Um, you know, it's about how you engage folk, being accountable, being responsible, and having reasonable, real solutions to the challenges that they face. It's about making a difference. Because I know if it wasn't for Ms. Fort, Ms. Singleton, Mr., uh, Mr. Cowens, Coach Johnson, Ms. Vaccaro, you know, and, and, and Coach Sash, man, I be I could be easily be dead or sleeping under a damn bridge. You know, folks made a difference in my life. Now I had a foundation. You know, and my old man, I used to hate my dad. You know, he was my little league coach, and there was a kid on the baseball team. His parent, his mom wasn't able to get him a glove. My dad used to take my glove from me and give it to him. And um, he could practice, and I'd have to stand there. I'd be so mad. But then, as I began to mature, I began to understand what he was teaching me. The kind of leadership that he was instilling in me to make a difference and to give back. For those who have been blessed, you have a responsibility. So that's what I do and that's how I live. That's the difference 
and I, what I believe is being inspirational as opposed to aspirational. Yes, ma'am. building trades um, are required by federal law to report their diversity numbers to the federal government on an annual basis. All of the unionized building trades. So the trades know how many women they got, they know how many minorities they have uh, in, each, in each of the 16 crafts. Um, what, what we've been able to do at the Pittsburgh A. Philip Randolph Institute is to build a relationship with the construction and building trades. As Sean and I were talking before you, before you came, uh, every African American business agent in the building trades, in, in, the, Pits, in the Pittsburgh Regional uh, Council of Building Trades is on the A. Philip Randolph Board of Directors. That, that is part of our strategy of how we create greater diversity. Um, the diversity coordinators uh, for each of the building trades we have a personal relationship with. I have a relationship with all the business managers. Talk to them on a regular basis. Talk to them about diversity. So do you have like gender, gender parity in um, the, the population? What do you mean gender parity? Yeah, guess why? And why was that? Why do you think that was the case? Because all we had for women was hairdressing and dressing things. <sighs> That's the trade. Well, um, what did you guys do? What did you guys do to recruit women uh, in the trades? Um, so child care? Uh, no, seriously. Um, seriously, seriously, seriously. And I understand there, there are a host of barriers. Were you able to achieve your goals? Yes. So um, um, you found a solution. Uh, how, how broadly are you sharing the solution that you, um, um, that you found? Uh, 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 there, are there are a million organizations that love to hear your story. Uh, because again, uh, in the building trades, they will beat the doors down for a black woman. They will beat the doors down for a woman in the trades. Somebody that's coming to get it every day um, that is going to overcome those barriers. Because again, <coughs> uh, part of what I did, what I've done during the uh, prior leadership of county council, I chaired economic development. Um, and I also sit uh, on all of the authorities where, uh, where corporations come to get money um, um, to, um, for whether it's a tax credit or whether they want the county to underwrite their bonds, their bonds. And that comes through economic development after it goes through the authorities. Um, I had a standing conversation with uh, the corporations and the, uh, the hospitals, the, uh, the universities, the business community, and we'd ask them for their diversity plan. If they didn't have it or weren't willing to share it, I'd table the hearing until they showed me what they were committed to doing. And I wanted it done on the design side, on the construction side, and the jobs that would be left post-construction. And if you're not prepared and committed to doing that, then you're not prepared to, uh, to be a beneficiary 
of our law justice in Allegheny County. The county executive agreed with me and supported my positions. Is it enforced? Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, they beating the doors down. We have lost stuff like that, but it's never been enforced. Well, again, you know, look, uh, if, again, um, we have to have accountability. So, but I'll come back to you and, and, and ask you, how are you sharing and how are you pushing and how are you being a real advocate? Because it's one thing to sit here and say, we've done something, but it's another thing to go and, and, and put forth what you've been able to achieve to the funding community, the foundation. Um, have, you, have, you, have you promoted it with the Jefferson Education Society? Uh, how, we, how can we promote this as a practice? Okay, so yeah, so I'm I'm telling you, you have to find solutions to the problems that you're confronted with, and you and you can't give in, you can't give out, and you can't give up. Mm -hmm. I think the key though is having leadership that believes in that and, yeah. and uh, practices those things. Because mm -hmm. you can only do so much when you're not in leadership. Yeah. But let's talk about a Philip Randolph Institute. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> um, because two years ago, 2021, DeWitt came with Cleola Brown um, for the Global Summit, and they talked about, um, I think it was about the Breaking the Chains yeah. of Poverty program. But let's talk about, can you talk about for a minute uh, the history of yeah. APRI? Um, when we look at the modern civil rights movement in this country, um, most many folk think about Martin Luther King post and Martin was uh, had the torch passed to him in 1963 but it was the advocates before that of which Asa Philip Randolph who came out of Plantation City Florida and uh, and Bayard Rustin, who was born in Chester, PA, and raised by Quakers. Uh, Bayard went to, uh, went to Wilberforce University, if I remember correctly. Those guys, along with many, many others, have created the, the kind of environment that we benefit from today. I'm not saying that everything is hunky-dory, but what I am saying is I'd hate to see what the hell we'd be in if they weren't there doing that fighting for us and providing that kind of leadership. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, Mr. Randolph was a real thorn in his side. And uh, Mr. Randolph organized uh, a number of wa marches on Washington. Uh, just a troublemaker before John Lewis. Uh, you know, and uh, he had an ally in the White House named Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, he'd have conversations with Mr. Roosevelt about issues, and he'd threaten him and say, we gonna, I'm going to put 10, 20,000 people in the street to protest. And Randolph would, I mean, uh, Roosevelt would tell him, make me do it at the end of the day. You know, uh, the 1963 March on Washington, uh, where Martin gave his I Have a Dream speech. It was organized by three, three primarily three men. Asa Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, and a white union leader of the United, the United Auto Workers, Walter Ruther. The auto workers put up to, uh, most of the money. So that talks about the Black Labor Alliance. Mm -hmm. 
because there is a black labor alliance that we have to build upon every day. You know, folks understood. And because of the difference, black folks are, even in these crazy environments where unions only represent less than 12% of the workers in this country, black folks are still more prone to belong to unions because black folks know and understand to this day what collective work will bring you. Uh, who was it? Uh, sister girl, uh, and we were talking about it, um, talking about stuff about America uh, before, about an hour ago, and um, some of the struggles that we face. Much of America still wants to operate off the theory, you know, this is the wild, wild west, and, and John Wayne can ride in on a, big, uh, on a big white horse with 44s blazing, promoting rugged individualism. <laughs> you die. You get abused. You get nothing. We were talking about that, weren't we, Sean? Shane. Shannon. Shannon. I, hey, man. Call, I apologize. Um, so, look, um, it is collective work, collective effort. How do you think we can, as a society, as a nation, move more away from that individualism and more toward collective thought? Uh, it is, well, let me, let, let me move to that by finishing that, um, that earlier question. Uh, the National A. Philip Randolph Institute was founded in 1965 by Randolph and Rustin. The Pittsburgh chapter of the A. Philip Randolph Institute was founded in 1968, August of 1968. We made a shift, uh, and, and, and it was all about then, uh, the so, uh, primarily social justice along with um, a real taste of economic justice. <coughs> I came to Pittsburgh in 1995, and we put a huge amount of effort into the social justice voting rights kind of piece that we that it, A. Philip Randolph has historically done. But because of the kind of leadership of our immediate past president, Leo Girard, in 2003 in Memphis, Tennessee, Leo and I had a conversation about economic justice and training and workforce development. And out of that, breaking the chains of poverty was, uh, was born. Mm -hmm. We have to have these conversations. We have to build, we have to go back and rebuild the basic coalitions and overcome um, how, we, how disinterest is, is, is fostered. The, de the, the continuing decline of the union movement um, in labor law and how we are shifting to the, the future of work. We have to do a better job of unionizing, understanding, and having union organizing become community organizing. Mm -hmm. um, we have to rebuild the infrastructure in our community. We have to go back and rebuild relationships. You know, um, we've become a disengaged kind of society. Uh, our decks on the back of our houses. Um, we put fences around our yards. We don't do stuff collectively anymore. And you know, as a result, we 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 disassociate. We have to rebuild those kinds of relationships and rebuild our community. Mm -hmm. rebuild a sense of camaraderie that we understand and that we're engaged and solve, and solve simple problems and, and build upon that. So how can, um, how can unions, oh, does someone have a question? I can save it. I got plenty. A critical role. A critical role. Um, the the birth of the United Farm Workers was not about was not limited to the fields. 
It was, a, it was about a principle, uh, um, um, principle values of our society. I had my question. Uh, what was my question? Uh, <laughs> so, oh, how can, because you're clearly, you're doing this um, with APRI, but how can unions re-engage with their community? Um, I'm, real, I'm so proud of the Steelworkers Union. Um, and my relationship with Leo and with uh, uh, my relationship with the construction and building trades and um, um, and most of the and most of the uh, and, and most of the trades and most of the unions in in Allegheny County Leo uh, for an example um, in 2000 and when we were in Memphis he told me hey man you know uh, because we the steel workers put in two computer labs in schools in Memphis and he said and Leo, uh, Leo being a Canadian, um, uh, Leo used to call me D. Witt. <laughs> um, and so he says, we ought to be doing this in Pittsburgh. Um, and my response to him, Leo, uh, I, think you, I, I think what you just said demonstrates your, uh, your interest and your sincerity. But in every school in Pittsburgh, there is one, two, and sometimes three as many as three computer labs in those schools, the the schools don't need don't need that kind that money in that in that in that vein. What we need to do is invest in community-based organizations and help them build their character and their and their capacity. And so he said, your job is to go uh, 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 go bring me proposals to do that. Um, I found several community-based organizations that were working um, and struggling and trying to grow. Um, and the steel workers went and put uh, computer labs uh, in, uh, in, in some of the um, neighborhood community centers um, so kids could do homework uh, after school and during the day, folks could come in and do job search during the day so that we, that we could build power and understand that that, and that, that support came from, uh, came from the Steel Workers Union yeah. and we make differences in people's lives. Um, we opened a Y uh, uh, three blocks from my house, four blocks from my house, the Thelma Lovett Y. Uh, and I was friends with the executive director of the Y and he told me, hey man, you know, we need a scoreboard, man. You know, we need, um, you know, uh, for our gym, they don't. We don't have. We don't have any money. And we don't have any money to, uh, to have a scoreboard. Uh, I went to Leo and said, Leo, uh, what better way uh, than to stick our brand, uh, uh, stick our brand uh, into a, into a black neighborhood? Folks in that gym every day come in there and see our logo, and uh, and we build upon that as part of our marketing process and and and, and engaging the community. Leo said, find out how much it costs. Uh, um, I found out, came and, uh, um, and came back and told him a, a week and a half later, uh, he told the Secretary of Treasury, cut a check. Our logo sits today in the Thelma Lovett Y uh, on Center Avenue in the Hill District. Yes, sir. Training centers, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to do any type of apprenticeship testing, we have to go down to your fine city to do the testing. And then we also have to go to your fine city to do all the training. So, when it comes to the building trades up here in Erie, yeah, we have 16 building trades. But to get into the building trades up here in Erie, we have to go down to your fine city to, you know, and they have the carpenters have a fantastic building trade. Mm -hmm. building down there. We got the, the uh, down in um, uh, Zelianopo, outside of Zelianopo, you have that great building trades. The, the steam fitters. So for the steam fitters, yeah. they have a state-of-the-art training center down there. If we want to do anything down there, I mean, for around here, we have to go to your city. And when it comes to we're saying, hey, can you come up here to do the testing? And you know, when it comes to the minorities, we don't have a lot of people don't have the wherewithal to be able to get down to Pittsburgh to do to do testing. We don't have the wherewithal to go down there 
just a second. Now, um, um, are, um, uh, I need to ask a question. Sure. Uh, are you saying that for effect, or are you asking me for a response? I'm asking you for a response so that we can get something together up here so that we can try to break down that barrier of getting something up here. Because we've been trying to get building <clears throat> construction trades up here to address the issue. And it's just not just for the black folks. It's the white folks up here, too, trying to get people into the building trades. It's an act of God. And also, decisions that are made as to who gets into the building trades are made down in Pittsburgh. Not the guys up here, because our business manager, our business agents up here, they would like to be able to make the decisions as to who gets into the building trades. And they make recommendations, but again, they're frustrated because the recommendations are made by the folks down in Pittsburgh. Well, um, I don't believe now, <clears throat> um, I spoke earlier um, about trying to speak truth to power and saying things that might not um, be universally liked or appreciated. Um, the each trade has its own set of practices. Um, are, you, are you a craftsman? No, I'm not. I, I, I've been out here trying to get people into the building. I moved down and talked to you about, what, four years ago, five years ago? Okay. Yeah. Well, see, see how old I am? I can't even remember. Uh, you know. Um, yeah, I was lucky I still remember you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, for example, each of the crafts has their own set of practices. Um, and they do testing, um, each, um, the electricians do testing in this area. The operating engineers do testing in this area. I don't know what the practices of the laborers are. Um, I'm not sure of what the practices of the steam fitters are, but I do know each um, each union has its own set of, uh, of practices. And, and so um, I'd be, I'd, uh, I'd be uh, reluctant to wholeheartedly agree with, uh, with your description of, uh, of how, they, uh, how, how, how they engage. When you tested, did you test, uh, Shannon, when you tested, did you test here or did you test in Pittsburgh? Yeah. Well, specifically, um, specifically, each local union uh, will only interview a few over what they can. Well, if you know, if you know, if you know, there's no sense in me telling you. No, no, but no, well, let me finish. All right. uh, each individual craft will only interview a few more than what they can legitimately project. Will um, will have enough work for the entire apprenticeship period, because um, if you if you take in more apprentices. Then, um, then they can legitimately finish their apprenticeship um, and work slows down, somebody gets left out. 
So look, uh, there is no system that is perfect, but folks are willing to listen. Um, the trades are just uh, are not unlike other folk. They um, they are willing. Uh, I've had I've had fights with the trades, but um, but we but we work through stuff, and we find common ground. So you know, again, um, I don't want to be disrespectful. I really don't. I really don't. Um, but I found the trades to be generally, not in every situation, but generally accountable and responsible. And that they know that they need women and minorities to meet their, to meet their diversity requirements as part of the contracts that they're facing on that, on that side of the business. Yes, sir. Let, let's assume that transportation is not an issue, it's not a hindrance. And we're just talking about getting people locally, minorities and otherwise, to be interested in the trades, right? So, you know, at the heart of it, how do we do that? Is it, is it with guidance counselors? Is it with the school? <laughs> where, where are we? I'll get, we'll come to you next, ma'am. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, well, look, as I was sharing with Sean, uh, Shannon, <laughs> as I was sharing with Shannon earlier, we were sitting here talking. Um, we have built a relationship out with Duquesne Light. Uh, we've built a relationship out with Duquesne Light where we are going to, and, 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 and a charter school that's located across the street from the steelworkers headquarters where we operate out of, where we are, we are beginning to go into middle schools and start talking to kids about the crafts. You're not going to fix it in one fell swoop. What you have to do is create uh, awareness and build upon it on a year-by-year -year basis. Yesterday, we, uh, there was a charter school right across the street from our headquarters, and we had a working relationship with them. But um, that relationship collapsed during COVID. We met yesterday <clears throat> and had a conversation about how we rebuild that relationship. And we're taking it a step further. We're taking it a step further. We're building, we're, we're building a program that will, um, that will provide an introduction as a, as a freshman, compounded as a sophomore, build upon it as a junior, and take them to site visits to construction and building trade sites as seniors so that they have a leg up in terms of career opportunities as seniors. And in that, we'll, we'll, we'll teach them about that, that, that learning is a lifelong obligation and they have to build the kind of skills and personal discipline now so that uh, they don't catch a damn uh, stupid case as, a, as another kid and, and, and get screwed up on some, on some BS. Sis. So, you kind of hit on my point. The reason I'm here is because I'm trying to figure out how to get the kids to come to the Let me, let, me, let me say this. Um, I'm going to give you my card. <clears throat> Have your son reach out to me. When is he, um, when is he he's going down, coming down this summer? Yes, he'll be at Duquesne um, <clears throat> since he was moving. But, you know, 
have him, have him call me uh, on a Saturday. Um, I will introduce him to, <clears throat> um, to the assistant to the president of Duquesne University, Bill Jennerette. I'll also introduce, have you, uh, introduce him to Crystal Ware McCormick, who's the diversity officer at, at Duquesne University. And uh, if he's willing, if, he, if, if he's about doing what he needs to do, they will nurture, they will, they will help him um, succeed. And if he wants to know more about the trades, uh, I, will, uh, I will hook him up with folk in the trades that he will have an opportunity to build the kind of choice that he needs to build to be successful. That he will understand how to define the word success, how to measure success, and how to achieve success. Um, I can't speak to Erie. I know, uh, look, I know on, uh, on uh, second and fourth Saturday, IBW Local 5 uh, is up in Grove City. Uh, I know that because um, the, the vice president of IBW Local 5 uh, is, is a friend and he's a board member of the A. Philip Randolph Institute. And I know he's up, I know uh, he and the president and the training director come up to Grove City every second and fourth Saturday, uh, Thursday. Now, what they do up here, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but you I know they're up here. But, but, I'll find, but for you, I'll find out. Okay. So look, um, um, Well, well, you know, uh, my man, uh, uh, my man here. Fred. Uh, uh, no, in front of Fred. Jim. Jim. Uh, um, we are one of the things that we do through the A. Philip Randolph Institute is try to try to build coalitions um, through an operation we have called PA Black Votes Matter. We work with Jim and, and we work with Fred in in the past. We're getting re up there, and we want to build a, a broad based coalition because ultimately, what we really want to do is to start an A. Philip Randolph chapter here. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about that for several years, and we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done because, again, um, it's all part of that whole process and how we build, how we build collective power and strength and engage in, in, in truly transformative practices, not just for black folk, but for the, in, in, in the, in the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. if, black folk, if black folk prosper, white folks gonna prosper. You know, I had a, I had a conversation with one of my staff today. And uh, you know, uh, I'm, um, you know, just a young brother that's, that's growing and learning. And we were talking about, and you know, I'm teaching him about how unions work. And I, I shared with him, you know, about collective bargaining, about how some of the progressives ain't never negotiated a contract, don't understand how, uh, how bargaining work, and don't understand what the implications of that stuff is. And ultimately, what I said to him is no one can afford to pay an individual more than the value of the product that they're producing. They'll go out of business. If a corporation can't generate a profit, why should they hire you? Now, that might sound very, very as, a, as a trade unionist, that sounds really harsh. But it's the truth. If, if they can't make a profit, how are they going to pay you? The horrors of capitalism. Yes. Yeah, Fred. I think a lot of cases, we don't promote ourselves. We expect other folks. 
Let me, let me, let me, let, let, whoa, 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 whoa. This is my show. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is my show. This is my show. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Whoa, 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 whoa. Look, <clears throat> um, check this out. See, now you done went into my wheelhouse, you know. Um, Check this out. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I told Raven, don't be throwing me no softballs all night. <laughs> you know, you know, give me the high fast one. <laughs> uh, check it out. Anyone that has been listening to news over the past several years and reading newspapers over the past several months has had to read the stories of declining enrollment in, um, in, in academic institutions, whether four-year or community college. Enrollment is declining. Now, there's always going to be a need for academia. And there's always going to, and learning is a lifelong obligation. Mm -hmm. But if you become a journeyman electrician, Carpenter, steam fitter, operating engineer, by the time you complete your apprenticeship, and you will be paid during your, you will, you will earn while you learn, you will be less than, dependent upon the craft. 10 hours away from an associate's degree. And you didn't pay for none of that. You got paid for that. So I think now is a good time to talk about, let's bring it back to the Breaking the Chains of Poverty program, because that's a pre-apprenticeship program that helps people get into apprenticeship programs at the different trades. Um, registered, we are the only African American owned and operated, registered pre-apprentice program in Western PA. It took us 18 months to get that. Now you talk about frustration, you talk about challenges, you talk about getting tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. But guess what? You got it done. You Man, did it. you know, we are there. Uh, we have Guaranteed, if you come to our program and successfully meet our, uh, uh, complete our program and get a letter of recommendation, you will have a guaranteed interview with IBEW Local 5, Steam Fitters Local 449, Sheet Metal Workers Local 12, and a direct hire relationship with the uh, with the laborers union of Western PA. Hey, uh, that's because all of those crafts know who we are and what we do and how we do it. We are, we are bull nose, we are bulldogs. In order to become um, um, a participant in the A. Philip Randolph Breaking the Chains of Poverty program, you gotta be 18 years of age, have a high school diploma, or an equivalency degree. You gotta, you gotta pass the test of adult basic education and pass it at, grade, uh, at, 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 at 11th grade reading and math. Then once you, and if you don't do, if you don't, if you test and don't meet our standards, we will partner, we have a partnership arrangement with Literacy Pittsburgh that you go to remediation with Literacy Pittsburgh and they will make sure that you get to the point where you meet our standard. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, then we bring you in, uh, well, I'll come back, I'll come to you sis. Then we will bring you in for a panel interview where we beat up on you. We want to know who you are, what you're doing, how you're going to do it, and where you at. 
you know. And sometime after you, I, I, you're uncomfortable to begin with, but after you think you've gotten comfortable a little bit, I'm going to ask you, when the last time you hit that loud? <laughs> uh, for, for <laughs> you know, uh, because again, uh, Gotta be drug free. we guarantee to employ our employers, um, folks that take our folk, whether in the building trades and healthcare or in manufacturing, that you're drug free. And so, uh, if you pass the drug test, that's the last piece to get in. You're evaluated on a weekly basis over 10 data points. One, um, each data point, has, you're ranked one to four. One that you're meeting all of our standards. Four, boy, you got a problem. You got a score below 20 every week. We want you to get closer to 10, but it's hard to get to 10, but you can get to 16, 17, 18. Because if you score more than 20 two weeks in a row, you got to come see the principal. No attitude adjustment, you got to find some place else to hang out. We provide stipends, $30 a day to offset your food and transportation costs. And you don't have any transportation costs because we give you a bus pass. If you don't have a driver's license, we'll pay for you to go to driver's training. So you have your driver's license. Don't cost you nothing, except effort. I have zero tolerance for bullshit. Because an employer has zero tolerance. If you can't produce a value-added product, they have no use for you. Brutally frank. I'm not, I'm not in this huggy kissy kind of uh, process, and we are, we are not that way. But you are supportive. Oh, man, bend over backwards. Mm -hmm. You got a problem? How can we help you? Uh, we have relationships with Catholic charities. You need glasses, we'll get you glasses. You need mental health work, we have a relationship with UPMC, Mercy Behavioral Health, we'll get your mental health um, um, support. If you need help, we are there. We just have low tolerance for BS. You want to be treated with respect and dignity? You got it. You want BS? Go find someplace else to hang out. Ain't got time, nor the inclination. Somebody else wants it. Let's go. The sister in the back and then you. So that sounds fantastic for the residents of Pittsburgh. Um, and as I look on, especially young African Americans who may, may males who may graduate from high school and they don't go to college and they're just sort of hanging out on the block, I guess it goes back to what one of these gentlemen, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, what can we do in Erie? Because we don't have an Ace Phillips Grand Ole Institute. You will. You need one. Mm -hmm. and not just one where, you know, he's barely making minimum wage, yeah. but something that can um, be a life-spending type um, career. And, and there's, you know, your program sounds fantastic, but it's not here. In Erie. So, you know, that's, one day. that's my concern. Yeah, look. Um, um, We have had multiple conversations, and uh, some of the folk that we've had conversations with see this as an opportunity for them to get paid.
there are some who see it as an opportunity to engage in transformative work. We're going to do business with folks that want to do transformative work. Um, I do this pro bono. Wait a minute, I'm lying. Let me take that back. Uh, I get paid $250 a month. It pays my parking at the Steelworkers headquarters. I put in 50, 60 hours a week, every week, because it's the right thing to do. Because I know, for me, that there but for the grace of God go I. We have to, we, we are going to continue to try to build the kind of energy here in Erie to start an A. Philip Randolph chapter and to expand our breaking the chains of poverty. Because there are organizations that are interested in expanding their presence in Erie that are already here but want to expand their presence. So um, I, you know, I have both the greatest hope for you to continue a relationship with your grandson and tell him that keep living, but keep his nose clean, because that's the most difficult thing that he has in front of him, that he doesn't do anything stupid to catch a case, to run your money down and, 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 and give folk a reason to look at him cockeyed. The one great thing about the building trades is this. They don't care where you've been. They care about where you're going. So um, just don't do stuff. Don't do something stupid. Don't, don't pick up a pistol. Don't catch a stupid case. The, and, and, and you know, again, uh, you got to talk to them straight up. Because, look, uh, peer pressure in them streets are out there talking and working every day. And uh, everybody want to have some. And, you know, uh, if, if you're out there in them streets, you're going to put it, and, 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 and you want to have something in them streets, you got to put in work. You got to put in work. No matter what you do, you got to put in work. You got to think strategically. What, what is it going to look like in six months? And um, what is it going to look like in a year? Don't give in, don't give out, and don't give up. Do not surrender. It's tough. Hey, look, I hate to be 19, 20, 21 years old now. Man, it's crazy out here. You know? Are there any more audience questions before we wrap up? I have a final question, but. I just have one gas pump question. Um, since COVID, as far as female employees concerned. I didn't, I didn't understand what, Coleman? COVID. COVID. COVID, OK. okay. Uh, female unemployment for commercial travel life has gone up. Yes. Could you speak on that? Uh, look.
Sisters want independence. They want to be self-sustaining. Uh, they tired of being CNAs. Uh, you know, we, 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 we tape and we record me, so I can't say what I'd normally say in another situation. They're tired of wiping somebody's behind. They want to get paid. They want to earn a living. They want decency. They want independence. Uh, a young lady that came through our program, she had been in a battered relationship. And she shot her, uh, she shot her significant other. Uh, she came into our program, did the things that we needed her to do. Uh, because of my relationship, not only with the building trades, but with county government, Allegheny County hires at least 10 of our graduates every year for the county payroll in various departments and various operations. I'm proud of the relationship I had with Richard Fitzgerald. And she is now in the public works department. She used a, a, a Pell Grant to go to CCAC Boyce and get her CDL. Uh, because of her because of her criminal conviction, uh, conviction, she's having problems getting her hazmat certification. In order to become a truck driver for the county, she has to have a hazmat certification. We're trying to match uh, an employment opportunity with her CDL. We're going to get it done. See, and that's another piece about the breaking the chains of poverty. Just because you graduate, you are ours for life. Uh, you part of the APRI family. You know, like, uh, like Don Corleone, say, sometime I'm going to come to you. <laughs> and I'm going to ask of you. Yeah, absolutely. We're about relationships. We are about family. We are about really making a difference in people's lives about the real transformative practice, those transformative practices. So yeah, uh, hey amen, look, uh, uh, I know six females off the top that are uh, uh, over, uh, over the road drivers. I know several that are local drivers and again, I have, I have conversations with the Teamsters. You know, check this out. Um, Hat ad. Um, the, the state of Pennsylvania just raised, as an aside, just raised its film tax credit. One of the, <laughs> uh, uh, there's so many movies being filmed here in, uh, here in Pittsburgh and in Western PA, all over PA, Western PA. And those truck drivers for Hat Ad are Teamsters with CDLs. So look, man, it's about, it's about finding a space for you that you fit in, that you can maintain your dignity, and having these kind of strategic conversations with folk about opportunities that exist for them that really gives them a top, an opportunity to feed, house, clothe, educate, and build a future for their families. Thank you. Um, any question? I was wondering if you could please comment on the recent Supreme Court decision about the concrete masons in Washington State, where Supreme Court Justice Katanji was the only genuinely pro-labor vote in the decision for the right of unionized workers. To uh, I'm, I'm tell me, I, I'm, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar with the decision. Okay. So, so uh, there was a case brought before the Supreme Court involving the uh, customers of a concrete company, and the employees of the concrete company were unionized. Their contract was expiring, and so they had to walk off the job. 
When they walked off the job, they flipped the switch so that the tumbler was still rolling. Oh, yeah, I think, uh, go ahead. And so when the case came before the Supreme Court, eight of the justices unfortunately voted against the- Hot Supreme cargo. Court. Hot cargo? Hot cargo. Um, <clears throat> rightly, wrongly, and differently. When um, those guys, they knew what they were going to do. Uh, they walked out. They walked out with ready mix in the uh, in the trucks. By by walking out, the, the, uh, that concrete that concrete set. Um, there's a hot cargo provision in the National Labor Relations Act, rightly, wrongly, and differently. Now, again, um, I'll say this. Far too often, workers, workers get screwed by labor law. Um, and a different, as someone who have um, tried our cases before the National Labor Relations Board, who've had, who you know, I did um, as a as an uh, as a steelworker staffer, I did organizing cases, I did. Uh, administrative, I, I, I've heard, did, done cases with administrative law judges, and I've arbitrated as a union rep many, many cases. Um, for every decision, for every decision that the NLRB is ruled or an arbitrator is ruled one way and provided a decision, you look at a similar set of circumstances and situationally an arbitrator or a judge has, a has ruled in 180 degrees opposite. Um, I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's what is. The, the difference um, is that hopefully, um, with what's breaking in the news about a couple of our Supreme Court justices, that at, that at best they'll have to rec recuse themselves from everything, or they'll have, or they will uh, get removed from the court, and we'll get a chance to replace them, and with more affirmative justices. It's what is. It ain't fair. It ain't. But uh, as Shannon and I were talking about, uh, talking about it early, uh, I try to avoid using the word fair because that's so situational. Okay. Um, we'll wrap this up with. Um, could you tell the audience some? I don't know. Inspirational stories about like outcomes from the Breaking the Chains of Poverty program? Man, there are so many. There's just a myriad of them. What's a really good one? <clears throat> That's how it really, it really impacted someone's life. Uh, an electrician, there's a, there's a myriad. I'll talk about um, Charles Struthers. Uh, there's a video, you go to our website, uh, www.pittsburghapri.org, and look at some of the videos. Incredible stories. Charles Struthers is uh, now a seven year journeyman for IBEW Local 5. Uh, Brother Struthers, in one of the videos tells the story. He and all, and, and all of his brothers have been to jail. 
He said he, felt, he realized that there was a better way. If he had found out about APRI and breaking the chains of poverty five years earlier, he'd be a fifth year journeyman as opposed to a, a third year apprentice. Um, man, there's so many stories. God. Um, young lady named Natalie Eisman. And I'm going to say something that, that's going to be crass. Um, Tilly, we call her Tilly. We have a graduation ceremony. Tilly came to us. And Tilly came from a battered, uh, abusive relation, a, a, a myriad of battered and, um, and um, abusive relationships. Tilly was a prostitute. Tilly was a drug mule. Just an abjectly horrid life. At our graduation ceremony, Um, we give each student an opportunity to do a PowerPoint presentation. Tilly said, started her, her, her PowerPoint out with the first slide. Once upon a time, I was a hoe. <laughs> uh, because of breaking the chains of poverty, and went on into this last and talked about the inspiration, the values, the integrity that, she, that had been instilled and reinforced in her. That she has a chance to be successful. We got her a job. We, um, we used our relationships. She got, we got her a job in a steel worker shop. Tilly struggled and was late three times while on probation. They fired her. Those are the rules. Because you're part of the APRI family, you do the things we ask you to do. We don't throw you to the scrap heap. We try to figure out how we can help you get to where you need to be. Uh, this past Tuesday, uh, Tilly got her first paycheck as an employee in the Allegheny County Sanitary District. She works for Alcasan. And, and, and becoming an, a union member again. So there's redemption. There's solutions to the, mo to the majority of the problems that we're confronted with. You just have to stand up and be accountable and accept responsibility for what you do and what you don't do. We have to speak truth to power. We have to, we have to talk to folks respectfully, responsibly, and we have to be accountable. That's what it's all about. Every day, you know, every day, we have to make a difference. We have to provide inspiration, give people hope, because yes, we can. We're the little engine that can, that could. We can make that difference. Yep, and when you fall down, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and get to stepping. Mm -hmm. But they don't have to do it alone. Nope. And that's the key. Yep. Fam. Mm -hmm. Yep. So thank you. I hope you I hope I didn't offend anybody and you will let me come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, do it. We love it when you come to Erie. Thank you. Yeah.
thank you everyone for coming out tonight and I hope this was a very inspirational talk and I'm really looking forward to hopefully having an API up here in Erie because I think it would do very transformational work up here. So thank you and thank you, Duet. Thank you.